check. Okay. Okay. Uh, under, under, okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, under those circumstances that you outline, uh, which she asserts, um, uh, and I have watched that part of the video, but in which you say she asserts, that one third of ALEC members are, are Democrats, uh, since they claim over 2,000 members, then in essence they're suggesting that they have 700 uh, or nearly 700 Democrats as members. You know, I have no proof that that's the case. What I can tell you is based on what's in the public record. Uh, if you look at the legislators that are on the board of ALEC, all two dozen of them are Republican. If you look at the legislators that are uh, chairs of the ALEC task forces, the nine task forces, the, the, the legislator chairs are all Republican. If you look at all of the uh, state delegations, what they call state chairmen, the one or two people in each state that is tasked with having a duty to uh, introduce model legislation, all but one of them is Republican. And so when you add up the legislators on the board, the legislators who lead the task forces, the legislators who lead the state delegations, the math is one Democrat, 102 Republicans. So not quite a third. <laughs> <laughs> I would say not quite a third. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, she, that Reagan Weber said in our interview was that, you know, we just help out these poor new legislators because some of them are part-time and they don't have staff, so we're merely educating people. And I asked her if they, you know, she's uh, who they were using as their educators, if you will, and, you know, whether there were any people that would consider themselves to be either liberals as individuals or uh, progressive or liberal organizations. And she said, well, I can't think of any. Uh, you know, we, if, as long as they adhere to our Jeffersonian principles, we would, you know, that we'd be happy to have them, uh, you know, educate. But they seem to be only educating from one side of the political spectrum, if you will. Is that, does that comport with what you've found uh, in the legislation that you've published online, too? Well, I would say that um, a couple things. One is, in terms of the, the external analysis of ALEC, um, we don't have any evidence that they've ever rejected, uh, rejected a member, you know, a legislator, if they were a Democrat or Republican, from being a member. And so I suppose it's, uh, it's something that she could say in terms of uh, anyone who agrees with them could be, could be a member. And I'm, I'm sure that that's true. You, I suppose, part of the defining element is what you're agreeing with, um, what you're agreeing with. And so if you look in the education area, it's a widespread privatization of public schools. If you look in the healthcare area, it's opposition to health reform to provide basically Medicare for all or true genuine reforms that aren't really just voucher programs. If you look at Medicaid, you're going to be in favor of voucher programs. If you look at Medicare, voucher programs. Social Security, voucher programs. Privatizing uh, the Social Security uh, process. If you look at um, labor, anti-union uh, efforts to strip unions of their right to organize, their right to collect dues, uh, on behalf of their members uh, through the workforce. Uh, if you look at consumer rights, it's pro-corporate uh, in almost every respect, uh, everything tilted inside of, of the corporations. If you look at the tort reform issues in terms of the rights of Americans injured or killed by corporations, what you see is over and over and over again uh, putting your hand on the scale of justice to ensure that corporations uh, uh, can get off, don't have to take personal responsibility for the extent of the damages caused by their actions or their products so that it would bar juries, juries of your peer, from determining the true extent of your damages and compensating you for the true extent of the loss of your loved one or punitive damages to the extent the jury thinks is appropriate based on the facts in the case. You'd have to be in favor of uh, having no windfall taxes on oil companies, in favor of uh, in favor of um, uh, cutting the capital gains tax, having no inheritance tax, uh, limiting the ability of govern government to raise revenue. Um, there's just a, a, a litany of things. Now, of course, some of the corporations would say that they don't agree with all those things, they just agree with the things in their own area. But they're part of a group, they're posing up to a group that is advancing this really radical agenda across the board, and I think they're culpable. Yeah, that's interesting you brought the old kind of I asked her, can you foresee, could you foresee any circumstance where Alec would uh, be in favor of imposing, let's say, more regulations? I used the BP oil spill as an example. And she said, oh, well, maybe, but we thought the moratorium went too far. 
Um, is that a typical kind of thing, even in an extraordinary circumstance where an oil company and their uh, Transocean, the drilling company, were seem to be responsible for a major economic and uh, environmental disaster, that, they, that Alec would ever uh, say, oh, yes, we're in favor of at least a moratorium and taking a look at the regulations, and maybe we should have more regulation in this case to protect our environment. Uh, it seems unlikely based on the documents that are in this trove. Um, it's certainly the case that um, they, uh, there are a couple areas, I suppose, where they might impose uh, more regulation uh, from an ideolo ideological standpoint, but really not on business. Um, so, for example, they would require there to be uh, more uh, uh, business review of environmental regulations before they can be imposed. And so they create these things like new um, councils or committees staffed with economists uh, to decide whether um, this environmental reg regulation is good for business or not. And so they would add a, a layer of review by business people before, you know, in between the scientists and the uh, regulatory process so that if scientists, experts in their field, had made a determination, for example, about uh, a dangerous substance, a carcinogen or other um, harmful chemical, that the scientists that work for the state government uh, could not issue a ruling subject to public comment, uh, a proposed rule such as public comment and implement it. Instead, they would have to submit that to sort of an ombudsperson group of corporate appointees uh, to uh, sort of veto that and, and, and discuss the, the economic consequences of this poison, of allowing this poison to be regulated, for example. And so that would be an example in which they would impose more regulation, but to serve an end of thwarting regulation. Would you, would you say their model might be of the corporation, by the corporation, for the corporation? I would say that, <laughs> I would say that perhaps some of them think that. I mean, um, I don't know if, it, I, I would not think if anyone has ever said that uh, there, but um, it's pretty astonishing as they describe their, their uh, views as Jeffersonian um, in a way. It's, it's um, uh, we've seen a lot of spin over history and historical figures over time, and, um, you know, uh, it's interesting that they would choose Jefferson of all the people, of all the founding fathers to basically be the, the, uh, uh, father that they name for this uh, really corrupting endeavor. Um, I think that uh, I think that there's just no doubt that this is um, a pretty naked corporate agenda to expand its profits at the expense of almost everyone else. You can see it in the area of trade. You can see it in the area of tax policy. You can see it in the area of workers' rights, uh, safety laws, environmental laws. Um, it is a pretty extraordinary blueprint for uh, radically changing our laws in this country. It's indeed a reaction to um, the surge in progressive protections for people's health, the progressive protections for people's rights, for the rights of workers. I mean, we have a question of like how far will they go? They don't want any minimum wage. Uh, that's out. Uh, they don't want any mandates for employers to provide any uh, specific protections for employees for health care. Uh, they don't want there to be really any right uh, to um, be able to organize effectively as a union. They try to gut the union rights at, in every, about every turn. And, um, and then they want you to have to compete with third world countries and what third world countries with developing nations are paying their laborers. Uh, and the American worker has to compete with that because it's good for the corporate bottom line, but it's not necessarily good for America at all. In fact, it's terrible for America. Yeah. Another issue that uh, was pretty prevalent that I've been involved with a little bit is uh, voter, voter ID, voter, voter rights. And that seems to be another area that, you know, they say that was another issue that this Reagan Weber, the communication director, brought up is that's a nonpartisan issue, but, you know, it's, uh, it's not a corporate issue. But it seems that it's pretty core to our American values and the whole democratic process. And yet, Alec does seem to be pretty involved in putting forth the voter ID laws and voter ID uh, legislation across the country. Well, that set of bills uh, that has been steaming its way through state houses this spring, um, you know, is very troublesome in lots of ways because one of the talking points of the political right 
the Republican Party uh, in particular, is a rampant voter fraud, a rampant voter fraud, this idea that elections are being stolen by uh, fraud as opposed to, I suppose, stolen by the Supreme Court by five, guys, five people in the majority deciding to not allow a full recount uh, in 2000. But we'll leave that aside for now. Uh, they have been pushing this idea that American elections are full of fraud. In fact, any, any empirical study of the American electoral process would show you that there's actually extraordinarily little fraud, uh, not uh, uh, even really significant, statistically significant amounts of fraud within the U.S. electoral system for voting. Uh, certainly nothing like any other country that actually has a history of fraud, but they have sort of concocted the party, the Republican Party has sort of concocted this boogeyman of voter fraud um, as sort of a talking point to push through um, these sorts of provisions. So when you think about voter ID, on the one hand, people might think, well, I carry my ID because I drive, and so I always have my license on me, and uh, it's no big deal, but there are uh, a lot of people uh, in your neighborhoods who don't drive. There are a lot of elderly people who don't drive, who, who use other forms of ID. They have social security cards. They have uh, Medicare or Medicaid cards. Um, they have social, uh, social services cards from the state. Um, there are a lot of people who are students who change addresses. They move from dorm to dorm, or uh, they may move from, from their hometown to their college town. Um, and there are people who are poor and don't have really permanent residences but have moved during the course of a year. And so for them to maintain uh, a valid license of uh, where they're living right now can be a lot of hardship to get to the DMV, uh, to actually get there, to get a new issued ID with a new address. What's been happening in the country for a long time is if you have some form of identification and you have like a utility bill in your name and you can show that it's you, the, um, the voter, the, the, the registrars will let you vote. And in many jurisdictions around the country, and Americans know this, those, polls, those people at the polling places know the woman. They know their neighbor, uh, the elderly lady who's lived down the street for 20 years from them who uh, has been driven to the polling place. Uh, they know exactly who she is. There's no doubt about her identity. But this, these new rules are designed to make it easy to, uh, to basically block elderly people from voting on technicalities that they don't have a current, uh, a current valid non-expired, as if your identity expires, a non-expired driver's license or the equivalent ID, ID card to make it harder for people who receive social services, who are disabled, who don't drive and don't get around very easily, but who have other forms of valid ID for every other benefit that they receive, but may not be able to produce the kind of ID that some pollster wants, because maybe traditionally they might vote in favor of a party that wants to protect them from being thrown out and being homeless by not having any benefits. Or students. Students were an incredible factor in the 2008 election. It was widely noted, statistically significant, number of college students turned out. And these voter ID bills are designed to basically throw up obstacles for students voting. And I think that there is no way to really look at what that combination of that political agenda combined with this uh, operationalizing of it through these voter ID bills as, as anything other than serving that agenda. Now, um, Alec, of course, would say, no, no, it's really about fraud and protecting against fraud, and who could be against protecting fraud? Well, we're all against, against uh, voting fraud, but there's very little demonstrable fraud in this country, and um, there's just um, very hard to read some of these bills as something in some ways other than uh, aiding the people who they're honoring at all of their conventions, their speakers, who are a, a rock star list of luminaries from the far right of the, little, the political spectrum, of you know assisting the people who they think share their ideology. Um, so, you know, on the surface, they're nonpartisan. They uh, it's not as though they're um, electioneering in a in a um, campaign. It's not as though they're um, uh, putting people out there uh, in the electoral campaign. But um, I think what they do, and certainly voter ID bill is one of those areas where their activities seem intended to aid a particular um, agenda. So you have on your website, the 
org website, yes. uh, an action step where you're asking corporations to disavow their relationship with uh, with Alec. Is that yes? Is that so right? um, on alecexposed.org, we have, uh, in addition to um, providing people this information with access to this information, we have provided a tool for people to be able to contact some of these companies and say, what are you doing cozying up to Alec and cozying up to this agenda? Um, some of these corporations may say that they didn't you know, vote for that particular bill, but they're still members and they haven't walked away and there's no indication that they ever protested, for example, the voter ID bill uh, model legislation. And so when you think about, for me, looking at these companies, I think, you know, I, I've used bare aspirin all my life. I think about whether I'm ever going to use bare aspirin again. I don't know why a, a foreign pharmaceutical company with an American arm wants to be associated with an organization that wants to privatize public education and wants to, uh, wants to have model legislation that would gut the rights of working people in this country. When well, I think of Kraft Foods, uh, having grown up uh, with Kraft Foods in my house as a kid, uh, to think that profits from Kraft macaroni and cheese or uh, or the other, the other uh, products that consumers really like are, are being used to subsidize a group that's trying to, um, that's trying to push forward a really radical agenda of we can't even, that, that uh, Alex says, you know, we can't even uh, tax the windfall profits of oil companies that are the biggest profits basically in the history of the world. Um, you know, what is, what's Kraft doing being, being part of an organization that is advancing that sort of model uh, legislation. Um, you go through the other list, the, the liquor company, Diageo. Uh, a lot of those brands are, are brands people know. It's uh, uh, Jose Corvo Tequila. It's, um, uh, I think it's uh, a number of the, of the, I think it's Guinness, for goodness sake, uh, a beer that I <laughs> really like. Um, and I think, what is Diageo doing in bed with uh, all of these, um, this agenda? of model legislation to radically alter the way of life in America. And so when we thought that people should know who the corporations are who are in the leadership of ALEC, and they should be able to tell those corporations, what are you doing as part of an organization that's putting forth model bills on all these issues that hurt the rights of ordinary Americans, the future of ordinary Americans? I don't know if any of those corporations will, um, will step away from ALEC, but I think they should hear from people about whether uh, about the fact that they're involved in a group that has these uh, multitude of bills to radically alter the way of life in America. Do you think, because ALEC is a nonprofit organization, they enjoy uh, some IRS uh, benefits, if you will, because they say they're, um, they're not a lobbying firm, they're just, an, they're just educating people. Do you think they're at risk of losing their nonprofit status? You know, I'm not sure, but I know that uh, Common Cause uh, filed a complaint yesterday with the IRS, and that complaint has some really powerful arguments and evidence in it uh, that I think the IRS will have to take a hard look at. Um, the fact is that uh, we know, and uh, that complaint uh, uh, says that um, the legislators who are the state chairman, I'm not sure who the state chairman is in Michigan, I know who the state chairman here is in Wisconsin, it's Robin Voss, and it was previously Scott Fitzgerald, uh, that those chairmen have a duty to introduce model legislation. We know from the Common Cause complaint that uh, staffers from ALEC have called on members of these state legislators to help them pass legislation, to push for the passage of legislation. Um, and, um, you know, we know that uh, the primary, uh, one of the primary activities uh, in addition to its conferences that ALEC is engaged in, as Common Cause pointed out, is the task forces which are producing these model bills and then passing them off into state houses without any disclosure that they're ALEC bills that corporations voted on. And so, I think that there's a lot to think about. Now, uh, ALEC has claimed through one of its proxies that, um, in essence, other uh, nonprofits produce model legislation, so it's no big deal. But I don't know of another organization that actually has a process by which corporations are sitting down at the table and voting for legislation, handing it to these politicians so these politicians can go introduce it without any disclosure of the fact that their trips are subsidized by these corporations, that ALEC has these 
scholarships that they put together with corporate donations to allow legislators and their families to go to luxurious hotels and hang out uh, and get Alec propaganda and walk away with Alec bills and other perks, uh, go to liquor parties and um, other uh, in the past cigar parties and golf tournaments and boating expeditions and skeet shoots and a whole array of fabulous vacation uh, packages. Uh, basically, um, on, uh, the, on the bill of the corporations that are um, there with their lobbyists trying to get their agenda advanced in these states. And lo and behold, it should come as no shock that then those bills are introduced in the state houses across the country. What should be a shock, though, is there was no disclosure that those bills were voted on by corporations behind closed doors that this radical agenda is uh, at work. One thing I asked uh, Reagan Weber was about, you know, they, see, they are big proponents of transparency in government. But when I asked her if they would disclose who their corporate members were, oh, no, we're a private uh, entity and we don't have to disclose uh, who our corporate members. Has there been, have you been able to compile a list of, I mean, there's a partial list uh, on the website, the Alec Exposed website, but they have over, as I understand it, over 300 corporate uh, members that pay anywhere from seven thousand to twenty five thousand dollars to belong so they must be getting something for their money I assume well um, we don't have a complete list but we have a list that's underway that list is on our source watch site uh, which is another one of our wikis and um, we know uh, over time the list is probably much greater than 300 corporations and over time corporations have paid a lot more than twenty five thousand dollars a year for membership uh, until recently, they were paying $50,000 a year, up to, up to $50,000 a year. Is there a sale? <laughs> I think there were more corporations, and so they were able to reduce the cost for everyone. Reduce their taxes. Um, and, uh, but corporations, even if, they, even if they pay a $25,000 membership, they can also pay more. And um, I think that you can see through an Exxon. Uh, Greenpeace did a study of Exxon's donations both through its corporation and through its uh, nonprofit arm, and the amount totaled up to you know, over a million dollars in donations which is not, it's not the same as $25,000 a year for a particular period. You see with the uh, Coke industries. So let's say that last year, just assume, we don't know, maybe Coke only paid seven grand last year, but let's say hypothetically that Coke paid $25,000 last year as part of its continuing role as a longtime member of the board, uh, the corporate board, what they call the private enterprise board of ALEC. Uh, but then on top of that, um, two of the Koch Family Foundations, the Charles Lamb Foundation, which is uh, the, almost the entire board save one, is the family of Charles Koch, uh, gave Alec a substantial amount of money. And the Charles G. Koch Foundation, which is led by Charles Koch, gave Alec a substantial amount of money, which is total cumulatively in the year of 2009, uh, $200,000. And so that's additional um, you know, influence, it's additional um, investment in what ALEC is doing. And so corporations um, may be spending, or corporations or the CEOs that run them, or the foundations run by those CEOs uh, with their uh, incredible wealth, their extraordinary wealth, like the Koch brothers, um, may be giving ALEC you know, more than $25,000 a year, more than $7,000 a year, as part of supporting this vision for the United States. Just real quick, because I, I have to, we have to wrap this up real pretty soon here. But um, if if a, if an average American wanted to boycott every company that you're aware of that gives money to Alec, would we be would we have would we all be reduced to growing our own gardens and making our own gasoline? <laughs> no, no. But you know, Coke is particularly problematic because they um, you know they make jet fuel and uh, mix jet fuel and they uh, they're as as um, they told uh, uh, the the reporter that they got to cover them after the, uh, after the controversy this spring, basically the reporter said, every, when you wake up in the morning, by the time you wake up in the morning, by the time you go to bed, everything you do is touched by coke. Uh, it's the gas, the natural gas in your home. It's, it's the carpet under your feet as you get out of bed. They had this very nice little cozy story. Um, you know, so coke is a particular issue because it's, it's a conglomerate and it's really literally one of the biggest companies in the world on the planet. Um, you know, I would say that I would say that really, um, in some ways, it's this interesting question of branding, and I, I don't want to go on too long about this. But you know, one of the things we monitor at the Center for Media Democracy here is um, uh, corporate brands and corporate PR and 
uh, the, the marketing of products. And so a lot of the products that these corporations uh, make are very familiar to us. They're highly advertised. They have a strong brand recognition. And there's a certain comfort that people have with the uniformity of, of that brand. That they know what they're getting in essence. But I think that, you know, in this area and so many areas, uh, what we should be doing is investing in, in local businesses. We just have to invest in our local businesses, whether it's a local farmer or whether it's a local shop down the street, the local restaurants, versus the corporate food, uh, the corporate uh, companies that are basically outsourcing our profits, uh, out, in many instances outsourcing their profits overseas, in many instances investing in overseas operations uh, rather than investing in the American workforce. Um, we, you know, regardless of uh, this situation, I think we have, we have many choices to make and one of those choices is to do everything we can to invest in businesses that really are here, that really have uh, values that are not contrary to the rights of the American worker, to civil rights, to voting rights, to the rights of people to have dignity in their age as they get sick and get old and uh, need our social safety net to survive. Um, I think we need to do a better job of making choices with our, our money. And uh, this instance with these allied corporations does present people with some choices to make. Great. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Thank you.